Hello and welcome to Eavesdropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And we've just come back from seeing Till. Yes. Which is a film that tells a story that really needs to be heard. And it's been heard quite a lot, but I don't know that I've seen it on screen before. It's the story of Emmett Till, who at the age of 14, he's a black American boy, at the age of 14, he went to visit his family in Mississippi. He was from Chicago. Um, he, the details of the case are to this day not really known, kind of disputed, but he offended... Um, a white woman who was 21 years old who was um, running a convenience store and she sent her husband and his, I think, half-brother after him to kill him. And very famously, his mother, Mamie, had photos of his mutilated body published um, in... I think particularly they were published in um, the black press. Jet Everyone magazine. saw no. them. Yeah, Jet Magazine. But everybody saw them. And she said, people people need to see this. It's basically saying to America, this is what your country is. Yes. You know? Well, actually, I thought that it was particularly pertinent uh, at this moment because there was an article in the New York Times just two days ago saying how uh, the Nazis had, in fact, seen America as an inspiration for their policies on the Holocaust. Yes, I've seen quite a lot about that, about how America was kind of real uh, sort of pseudo-scientific sort of starting points for a lot of racism mm. that the Nazi uh, Nazi ideas were built upon. Yeah. yeah, and that these policies of segregation and so on mm. were actually some of the things that at least initially inspired, you know, kind of a policy on the Jews. Mm. So... Um, I mean, it's a very, very famous case. Anybody who's read American literature, you know, of the last, you know, kind of 60 years, James Baldwin and so on, would know of Emmett uh, Till because his death and his mother's role subsequently was a real inspiration to the civil rights movement. And in fact, the Civil Rights Movement Act mm. got passed I think a couple of years after... The Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. Yeah. And this was 55. Exactly. Uh, though it was interesting at the end of the film to say that the anti-lynching law only passed in 2022, i.e. yesterday. Yeah. Right? So so these problems are still current and resonant. Uh, you know, kind of the incarceration of black people. Yeah, it's a systemic policy of racism in the United States, that's not too far removed from what we see in this film, in my view. Mm. I think, however, you know, we mustn't kind of get too lost in that and begin a little bit talking about the film, uh, which I think it's important to because I must say I dreaded going to see it. Mm. Yeah, because, you know, I knew the story and you think, oh, right, like... Um, what, 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 what was that? Oh, it's going to be disgusting or gory or middle of the road or what do you think what's that about okay several things i thought it's going to be just unpleasant because you know that it's about the lynching of a little boy mm. right so, and that the images of his body are integral to it exactly and then also the general treatment of these issues is often pedestrian and kind of mm. smug you know, and often not very, I don't know, for lack of a better word, artistic. Yeah, like kind mm. of, you know, it's its done with a seriousness of politics and a sense of social justice, but not necessarily in the most artful yeah. way. Not with poetry. It tends to be very literal. Yeah, exactly. So, so I was like, you know, very surprised by this film, I must say. And I was really kind of um, impressed. I mean, I, I think in many ways my judgment on this needs to be a bit suspect because, you know, one third of the way in the film, I was just in tears, really. You really? Know? And my glasses fogged up. Wow. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> no, I was kind of like, uh, you know, and I wasn't a wreck. I kind of, you know, I st my eyes stayed open until the end. Um, but, you know, I, I was immensely moved by wow. it. Yeah, how about you? Hardly at all. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I, I thought this is one of the worst directed films I've seen in a very long time. I thought oh, no. it was ugly. Oh, no. Oh, no. I, let's, we can disagree on that. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, thought, I thought visually it was it had, for a lot of the time, hardly an idea what it was doing. Oh, I disagree. Compositionally, it's all over the shop. No, I disagree. Well, 
Yeah, be and... welcome to. But okay, I, well, let me give I, you examples. I've, I've never seen the back of people's heads so much as in this film. Oh, just, okay. just, just stupid angles to shoot people. I, from. I don't agree. I thought it was all like very, very tactful and thought through. I mean, from the beginning, because I was very impressed by this image when. You know, they go into the barber shop where her boyfriend works and you get like this kind of fourth paneled evocation seen from the outside, you know, that just seemed to capture that period for me. So I thought there was a real attempt at working visually with the image. I thought it was beautifully lit. I thought every camera move was like purposeful. Mm -hmm. You know, there were these moments where they kind of they were going into the faces and you could just see how the movement itself was the creation of tension. No. Well, that barbershop um, bit that you talk about where she goes to see her partner, she walks into the barbershop, camera pans across following her, she's on the right of the frame, he's on the left, but then the camera just keeps going until you're looking at them in a mirror. Why? I mean, I thought it was stupid, pointless. I didn't. I, under- I, I, when she goes to see her parents, when she's saying, I need to go down to Mississippi, and there's a scene where her dad says, I'll come with you. She's just plonked on the right-hand side of frame in focus. The larger part of frame on the left is taken up by a dad out of focus, gurning in the background. Again, I can't understand the decision making. Well, I think I think it was all purposeful. I think there were similar kind of racks in focus, you know, which is kind of the back of her head, in which the crowd in front of her kind of uh, becomes out of focus, and in which the focus is is just on you know the microphone, right, on kind of the making public of this case. I thought there was a lot of things like that in the film, and I really admired it. In um, in court, they do the scene in a very long take, and that's the point of this scene, is to be done in a long take, where she's being questioned about um, the, the her son, her husband, who died 10 years prior, and identifying the body, because the, the case that the prosecution wants to make is that the body is so mutilated we can't even tell if it's Emmett Till, mm. and maybe her son is still alive, because if, if it's not the right body, then there's no murder. Um and the start of that shot is uh, she's on the left, um, facing right, and the jury's in the background. She's not facing them, so they're at uh, right angles to each other, and they're out of focus. Um, and the prosecutor, uh, the uh, defending lawyer, her lawyer, who's questioning her, is off screen. And he hands her this ring, um, which is the ring that Emmett was wearing. That's how we can identify it was him, or one of the reasons. Um, <laughs> that ring comes in right at the bottom right of frame. It's so, it, it's, it's really bizarrely I, I don't understand the composition it's just it, well it's not a composition it's it's amateur it just pops into the bottom right frame you have to search for it even though it's the focus of this shot and then um you get to the kind of the the point the starting point of this of this long take of this questioning which is was he your son when you saw the body could you identify it were you sure hmm. T- tell the jury and she turns to the jury and says yes it was him something like that and it's you know, a key like this is this is the thing. I'm telling you the truth. This is this is the body. She turns away from camera to do it, and the only reason they haven't cut to a shot of her actual face telling you this important thing is because they want to do this whole thing in one long take. Hmm. It, it, it's 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 avoidable, stupid. They could cut to the opposite angle and then continue the rest I, of the long. I, I I find it really really stupid. I couldn't. Un- well, I didn't. bad 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 visual direction. I I I disagree. I think in fact the opposite. You know, I think it was incredibly tactful on really difficult emotional material, you know, a lot of which was uh, close up on the actress uh, who I thought was magnificent. Um, Yeah, she was good. What's her name? Danielle Deadweiler uh, in a very, very difficult role to do. And I thought that the tact was one of the characteristics of the visual direction. So, you know, there's this moment where the jury kind of comes in, you know, and, like, you know, there are all these rural white people kind of smug and so on. And, you know, so there's a there's a sense in which the film conveys that, right, and then cuts away, yeah, like kind of, you know, because you could really overlord that kind of, Mm. you know, condemnation of that of that culture. So um, I thought, you know, it was it was just brilliant, really. Um, and there were visual things that were done, unlike, you know, kind of with a lot of film. I thought the feel for the period uh, and the, the pop music goes along with that. Um, I thought kind of, you know, the lighting, uh, which I thought was amazing, right? Uh, uh, I've, I've rarely seen black people lit so well. Uh, 
And then kind of, you know, what you're talking about, that camera, I mean, there's that scene where just before this, no, just after this stuff happens where, you know, the young black boys are just out in the evening and it's led by kind of these young women, you know, and the camera follows them kind of talking and, and gossiping. But then obviously kind of, you know, the 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 focus is on the context and the boys. I, I really, I was very impressed by it. So we have very... Yeah, I thought it was use. amateur. It's, it, it doesn't do nothing that interested me visually. The shot where she finds out that um, Emmett has died, you know, because there's, there's a search for him and she's told that he's dead, um, has this um, very, very slow contra zoom in her face. So it's, you know, the jaws shot, but... But, but not emphasising itself, right? It's slow, and it, and it really worked for me. I noticed it, and I got it, and I thought that really worked. And, you know, the focus is all on her face, as you say. Um, there were one or two other things, but for for the most part, I, I, thought, I thought some of the decisions were so poor, again, I'm just talking visually, that I thought they were calling attention to themselves. You know, I couldn't help but... Because I'm interested in the story, and I didn't think it was badly told. Mm. But visually, it kept calling attention to itself and distracting me. Well, it, um, uh, it wasn't distracting me. I thought, you know, it was it was beautifully told. And I think, you know, tact and restraint and and intelligence, you know, are the way that I would characterize it. I thought, for example, the shots of, you know, the mother working in the secretarial pool, you know, and the way that that was all edited with the camera kind of, you know, slowly moving in and the sound off and then kind of the sound comes on and you see she's the only kind of black face in it, right? And there's a kind of its own regimentation. There are what look like police, but you, you sense our clerks, yeah, kind of going up and down one side of the corridor. So on the one hand, she, you know, she's the only black woman there. Yeah, she's the only black woman who got the secretarial job, you know, in the, for the armed forces. Mm. And on the other hand, you see the, rem you know, the regimentation on that culture. So, you know, there's the relative freedom with Chicago, with, between Chicago and Mississippi. But actually, you sense of how regulated a black woman is in Chicago as well. You know, and it's all done visually in that shot. Yeah, it's also done literally in the shot right at the start when she's... Um, shopping in his apartment store. That's right. And she's the only black person there. And you get, and this is what I was saying, you know, when, when I suggested, oh, maybe you thought the, the film was going to be middle of the road and you said sometimes they can be quite pedestrian. This was right at the start and I thought, oh, here we go. We've, ha we've had the, oh, you're a black person in the 1950s being told not to shop in a nice shop. I, I just thought this, this is, this is going to be so bland. I and see, some of it was really like that. Well, I didn't think so. And I didn't think so. You know, for many reasons. I was very impressed by that shot in the department store because, as you say, it's a kind of a cliche. You've seen it yeah, many times yeah. before. But actually, I thought what counteracted that, you know, was her costuming, right? You know, the way that she's dressed and the way that her clothes moved. And, you know, it's very important, that whole scene, because actually she answers back, right? She tells the man, do you tell your, your white customers mm. this, right? Uh, and she's beautifully turned out. And I thought, actually... You know, that's also a running thing in the film. I was kind of paying attention just to her earrings and her jewellery, mm. right? It would, like, kind of would change from every shot. You know, there's a sense of that, you know, the underlining of, you know, the elegance and the middle-classness and the, you know, mm. a kind of um, dignity, yeah? Um, but more than that, a kind of a chicness with that dignity, the kind of, I thought, was very important in counteracting all the visual cliches that you normally get when this kind of story is told. Um, I also think that the first, it's, it's probably 30, 40 minutes of the film, of essentially setting up this family. Mm. and show, I thought that was feeding into everything I was fearing this film was going to be as well. The kid is so sprightly and jolly and dancing and all this. And I thought, I mean, you really shouldn't think in a film about Emmett Till that the kid is easy to hate. But I thought, what an annoying kid. You know, I'm not saying like I'm looking forward to him dying, but I, I, I thought this is, this is the most dull, predictable way of, of setting up, a, 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 you know, a beautiful, bright 14-year-old life that's going to be snuffed out sort of thing. Again, I didn't think so, and I thought he was very well cast, you know, because he's not a cute kid, right? He, he does look like an average kid, He's not, you know, he's not a twinkly charmer that they could have cast, 
right? He's not particularly pretty or anything. He look, you know, he's meant to seem like kind of like an ordinary kid, mm. really. Uh, so, so I, I kind of, you know, I thought, I thought that was like very well cast. I didn't like the return to that, the shot at the end where, you know, kind of. Um, she imagines him. She back, visits yeah. him bed, visits his bedroom. And actually, I do think the film should have ended with her speech. You know, yeah, I sort of thought that. Because um, actually, that's the sort of thing where it could really have delved into smugness, mm. which uh, you know you despise, and you've already said so. Um, but it really didn't for me. I thought it really worked, yes. and it was you know it was aiming at inspiration yes. to to you know what she says in that speech. And to be fair, she also says it in the trailer. Mm. So you know, the best bit is sort of in the trailer already. Is when she says. When black people got murdered in the South, I thought, well, it's the South problems. But now I realise that what happens to the South happens to the rest of us. What happens in the rest of the world happens to the rest. We have to treat it like it happens to the rest of us. We have to act like it does. And, you know, okay, there's an element there of, of you know, oh, it's just because it happened to you, now you're taking it seriously. But it's like, that's just how, that's how people get their consciousness raised about these things, right? And I think the film is aiming at, 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 at consciousness raising there. And it works. Yes, but, you know, it's not just consciousness raising. I mean, how many years? It's taken like half a century, you know, for the story to be told in cinema. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually do think it's like really beautifully told. To me, there were so many things that were so touching, you know, and that resonate with other aspects of black culture that one knows and is familiar with. I mean, and that kind of really uh, wrenched my heart. I mean... The, the scene on the train where the mother tells her son, make yourself small. I mean, you know, what kind of parent that would tell your kid, make yourself small, make yeah. yourself less than you are? Yeah, kind of warning about going to make yourself small. I mean, you know, kind of, I thought... Yeah. That's in his bedroom, isn't it? Thought, where, the, where the film worked best for me was um, when she gets his body back and she inspects it, and she touches it and cries over it, and then she has the open casket mm. shown for a couple of days. And you see people... Um, it's particularly the... Uh, is it her Is it her cousin who comes up from Mississippi, who's one, Who's the the mother that, um, that Emmett had been staying with? She, I think it was the aunt. The, right. She comes up and she cries over, over seeing his body at the open casket, and... Oh, that was a beautiful moment. We've seen crying a couple of times in this film by that point. It, it, it's, it's been Mamie crying. And it's really ugly crying, mm. you know? Like, it, she goes for it. And at, the, at first, when she first wails, like that, and it really is wailing, I found it a bit contrived. But when it happens two or three more times, and particularly when the sister does it, I thought, no, this is really working, actually. Like, you don't... This is realistic crying, right? This is... People aren't kind of worried about sort of looking good on film crying. Mm. Do you know what I mean? This is like people are falling apart at the sight of this child, this body, and and a child particularly that um, you know, is a family member of theirs. I thought it, it, kind of, it had to do it a couple of times for me to start buying it. Mm. But once I did, I found it very moving. Uh, that whole segment I find really moving because it's just, it's it's that is the key thing, I think, about the Emmett Till case in history that makes it so important is those photos that image of the body and when we get to it I, I think the way that it's um introduced to us is really important and quite tastefully done and quite quite well done you know because you you see um that they're in the morgue um and that emmett's body is on the table under the cloth but you don't see it it's it's blocked you know there's a, there's a, another bed in the way basically yeah. it's framed just so so it's blocked they take the cloth off and we still don't see it, but Mamie does. And then the camera rises up and we see essentially this whole body. Mm. I, I, I think that's incredibly well done. It's shocking. Well, I think the film is full of moments like that that are well done. You know, so for example, when they kidnap the boy, right, I thought it was so tactful, the choice not to show you. Yeah, the camera remains outside the place where he's being tortured, mm. right? You don't see any of that, and you don't need to see any of that, actually. Yeah, but somebody else might have chosen to show you some of that, right? It would have been like torture porn. Um, but they do show you black people loading the corpse into a yeah, truck. Yeah, yeah, black people right? who work for so, the So the, the film murders. becomes morally complicated mm. in all kinds of interesting ways, I thought. You know, there was the moment as well where they come to pick up the boy at the uncle's house, right? 
and you just get that sense of sheer helplessness, mm. right, uh, uh, against these two men. And it really reminded me of that James Baldwin speaking about, you know, so he cites the spiritual of like, like when a man gets the blues lord, he, you know, when a woman gets the blues lord, she bows her head and cries. And when a man gets the blues lord, he takes the train and rides. And he says, but nobody asks, you know, why the black man takes the train and rides. And basically then his whole argument is, you know, that kind of black men in America aren't allowed to be men in the way that the society expects them to be. And this was just that moment, right? Somebody comes here into your home, you know, kind of has all your family at gunpoint and you can't do anything about it, right? You know, to me, that it instantly brought up that whole kind of discourse to mind in a very kind of vivid, visceral way. I thought it was beautiful. And then, of course, the film makes it even more morally complicated because the fact is that the uncle had a gun. He could have fought back. And then there's that wonderful discussion, you know, kind of by the river of, well, why didn't you fight back? Mm. Right. Which is always an argument against kind of victims of this kind of, you know, social repression. Why did you fight back? And I think this film kind of explains what's at stake in that fighting back at something that is absolutely systemic. Yeah. Which needs collective action and to which an individual is helpless. So, you know, I thought the film was, was brilliant at kind of communicating all of that. Yeah, it's a very good scene, that um, conversation between um, the uncle and Mamie, where she confronts him about that. Um, it's also it also worked for me because it's one of the scenes where there was no soundtrack, um, no score. That is, mm. I think I've never seen a film rely so heavily and use so heavily for you know emotional manipulation. Its score as this, I, I thought it was dreadful. Well. No, I loved it. I oh, so we disagree so on everything. Overdone. We disagree on everything today. I thought it was like that, you know, wonderful kind of 1950s pre-rock and roll kind of boppy it was sound. Like, you know, that was both very soulful and often like uh, collective as well. There was a, like a quartet or something where a voice would come out. You know? I'm not talking about the songs. I'm talking about the score. Oh, There's an orchestral okay. score and it is so overdone, hmm. so overused. I, I thought it was really, really dreadful. It was underscoring almost every moment. Hmm. Um and like I say, it actually it drops out in that scene, um, and it really works. On it. The, the conversation is well written, it's well performed, it's even well shot for mm. the most part, and you know, it, and it, it doesn't need you know kind of uh, emotional string pulling from from the from the orchestra. I I, I mean I must say I, I didn't I, I didn't register it as a problem. Mm. Um, I didn't go into this film expecting to hate it either. I mean, and I don't hate it. That's way too strong, but. You're from the trailer. I thought this looks quite interesting, um, and it, it did look, I suppose, a little bit pedestrian, as you sort of suggested it, it might. Um, but I thought I will be interested in seeing this, and I, I am, I was more disappointed in it than I expected to be. Well, I just, um, I kind of just expected to be emotionally tortured. It was, you know, emotion, <laughs> emotionally tortured, also by bad filmmaking as well as the topic. <laughs> and actually, I must say, I, I, you know, I am very grateful to have seen it. Uh, actually, you know, I want to thank you because I, I really wouldn't have gone to see it on my own. And also I understand that Anna Hosey Davis recommended that we see it. So I want to thank her as well. Um, there's a couple of things that I also want to mention. You know, one is Whoopi Goldberg, right? Whom, you know, I just love, really. She, she it took me a while to recognize her as the mother, mm. yeah, uh, of Mamie in this story. And of course... You instantly recognize it through her voice. Yeah, you know, her voice is unmistakable. Though actually, I don't know if she's wearing makeup or latex or whatever. She is unrecognizable. I literally, until just you said that, I had no idea that she was in it. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. She is, she plays the mother. Mm. Uh, and what I thought was absolutely brilliant. You could tell it's a real performance, like the way that she holds her feet and her hands and, you know, it's, I think she was great. Yeah. And I, I was also, just thinking, where did they get this old lady from? She's fantastic. Yeah, Turns well, out it's Whoopi Goldberg. It's Whoopi, who was one of the, who was one of the producers of the film. Yeah. That, yeah. I saw her name on the credits, but that's as far as I went looking. You know, yeah. Yeah. And also I want to mention, you know, some other things because, you know, you get a sense of how important this film is. To black culture. It has so many actors as I recognize 
as a kid, you know, wa watching television, you know, I think, I think what, I'm not sure because I can't remember the name, but I think one of the actors in Benson was, is one of them, you know, I think he plays the uncle and so on. But you recognize all of these people and, you know, and here they are finally kind of doing something important or that they think is important. And you could see they're like, you know, kind of alive and giving it their all. This is like a really important story to tell. And they're there for it. Mm. Yeah. in kind of instead of just playing the token person in a sitcom or something. So so I, I, I love that dimension of it as well. And I, I just wanted to like signal that because, you know, kind of these things are difficult to make. And, uh, you know, they they require both an effort and yet you can see the importance of making them by kind of the energy that uh, I think the, the film brings out in all of these little kind of levels, the small parts, not just, you know, who plays Medgar Evans and what we know about Medgar Evans subsequently and so on, but actually just like the uncle. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so I enjoyed all of that. Uh, enjoy is the wrong word. I was I was really very very moved by it all. Mm. You know. Yeah. Well, I I, I we disagree. <laughs> I, my, I think visually it's a complete fucking mess. Uh, really, ooh. really, really is. I was I was distracted by how little sense it made visually. I was constantly questioning every, pretty much every every decision it was making as to where to put the camera, how close to framing, so close. Uh, you know where to place characters in the frame and where they should be out of focus. I thought it was a fucking casserole. Well, I disagree. Mm. You know, I thought, uh, uh, well, it's not a masterpiece of cinematic art, but I think it's a really great film. Uh, wow. And I would encourage everyone to see it. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, it's not, I, don't, I certainly don't think it's a really great film. It's all right. I think it's well It'll play well on television because well, everything actually, is in mega close -up. No, I don't think it will play well on television, actually, because... You know, I think you have to give yourself over to the film. It's kind of the tension you, because you know that what's going to happen and what's going to happen is so unpleasant and so on. I can't imagine myself watching it on television. I would have turned it off in the first 10 minutes. I do think it's a film to see in the cinema. You have to give yourself over to that tension. There's that, but there's also so much of the film is in incredibly close close uncomfortably close close up and everything is explained in dialogue it'll play well when you're not even paying attention to it on TV I don't agree I don't agree I think it's a you know it's a very well directed film it's very tactful you know and nuanced and attentive you know to uh, emotion um, so I you know we'll just yeah we're going to have to disagree disagree then. on this so uh, I really recommend that that, uh, that people watch it. I was kind of really surprised at my response to it. Mm, um, I'm surprised at your response to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, uh, thank you very much for listening. We're eavesdropping at the movies and we are on. Apple Podcasts, Audible, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter at Eavesdrop Movies. And the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.